All right, hello everybody, this is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check, so if you can hear my voice, please type in why. All right, got some quick triggers out there today. Just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance, and it looks like we have a minimum of a delay here on the audio visual, the audio visual feed for today. Sorry, my mind's already elsewhere. I'm already thinking about that U.S. dollar. Um, so we're in the final couple days, well, I guess now at this point, final day and a half of what's considered to be summer months trading. We have Labor Day this weekend in the United States, so it's going to be a public holiday, well, a U.S. holiday on Monday for a long weekend. But after we come back on Tuesday, it's largely considered the return of volatility or the return of liquidity, at least, as we'll get a lot of traders arriving back into New York, coming off a holiday, et cetera, et cetera. Traditionally, summer months are boring, slow, low liquidity. It could be jagged. It could be sharp, meaning with the lower liquidity levels, Prices might have a tendency to test below support before bouncing back, uh, what we call barbed wire from a price action perspective. This summer has been quite a bit different. We've had some good drive in the U.S. dollar to work with. We've had some good bearish momentum to work with in the euro. And as we wind down the summer and go into September, there's a number of really interesting themes that we could look at uh, that I plan on going over today. So without further ado, I'm going to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to get right into the charts. We're going to start chopping some of these up. But as usual... This webinar is all about you. So setups you have or markets you want to take a look at, fire those my way, and I'll do my absolute best to answer those when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Disclaimer part one is here. Trading is risky. Hypothetical trading disclaimer. This is disclaimer part two. Gonna look at some past trades, gonna look at some strategy. Have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. Good question here from Usain, and I'm gonna try to do well with this one today. Uh, Usain says, could you please share, uh, give me one second, let me scroll back up in the comments. Uh, could you please share when you go through the crosses to show weekly or monthly charts to take screenshots? So I don't have much for crosses today. I do have a few I wanted to look at. Pete had reached out about Yin uh, yesterday over Twitter, so I wanted to give that some good time today. But uh, yeah, what I'll do is I'll try to leave the chart up for a minute or two uh, while I'm doing my little speech around that setup or that market, and you could take as many screenshots as you'd like. But also of interest, I am going to post this as an article to Daily Effects that will have a screenshot or an image of each of or most of the charts that I'm discussing today. So hopefully that'll make it a little bit better, give you a better image quality. Um, and, you know, something you could download if you so choose. But let's go ahead and get this started. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, it hasn't been a typical summer in the fact that we have seen or continued to see some really good volatility across global markets. For FX, I think a lot of that volatility has been driven or can be attributed to this, the U.S. dollar. Uh, we came into the summer with a full head of steam. Notice that we set this low in April. We rallied throughout May. It's a really strong month of May here in the U.S. dollar, but we're going to tie this in with a bearish theme in the euro uh, here in a couple of moments. Now, prices in the dollar topped out in May at this 95 level. After we pulled back, came up and we set another high right here at 95.53. Now, that resistance remained for the bulk of July. But notice that we still did retain some of those bullish trend qualities. Now, we looked at this as an ascending triangle formation as we came into August because we had this horizontal level of resistance here at the top side of the zone. We had this higher low or series of higher lows as represented by the bullish trend line. And then it was just a week and a half into August that we saw that top side breakout and prices ran all the way up just a bit shy of that 97 handle. But that's when the music stopped about two weeks ago, it was Wednesday, and prices have been on the retreat ever since. Now, if we go down here on a four-hour chart, we can see where we had this continuation of lower lows and lower highs and lower lows and lower highs, and I mean, we eventually rattled through that support zone or back through that support zone. Came all the way down to test at those August lows right in here. We looked at that on Tuesday. And as I shared, this was starting to open the door for short-term bearish operations in the U.S. dollar under the presumption of Short-term resistance around prior support. That's what's been happening. Notice that swing came in very close to that prior swing low. Came back down. Now, we did get a higher low element of support earlier today, earlier this morning, right around the euro open. And then prices came back up to find resistance on the underside of that prior bullish trend line, which is still holding at this point. 
So at this stage, shorter term bearish setups can still be supported in the US dollar. Under the presumption that we have lower high resistance, a stop could be set above this 95 figure to look for a retest of 94.50. Now, the bigger question that I have is where this might fit. This US dollar chart looks really clean. The problem that I'm having at the moment is finding setups that are very accommodative for US dollar weakness. Now, I have a newish setup to look at today in pound dollar, where I do think the backdrop could be a bit more supportive for a continuation of dollar weakness. But scrolling out here, and let's go out to the weekly. There we go. If we do see a hold of support and we see prices closing towards that 95 level, then we have to keep the door open for bullish continuation in this theme, simply because we've only retraced about 23.6% of that major move at this point. This retracement is still rather shallow. There we go. And so what I've done here is I drew a Fibonacci retracement from the February low up to the August high. Notice that 23.6 retracement comes in right at 94.92. And if we go down on like a four hour chart, we can see that that's the level that's helping to set these near term resistance points. So the longer term bullish trend is still alive as we've only retraced, I would say maybe about 30% of that at its max. But if I'm gonna look to buy this thing, I need it to show me something first. I need to see a break in this bearish short term price action, which can be indicated by a move back above that 95 level, okay? Move back above that 95 level could reopen the door to US dollar strength under the presumption that we dug down, found support off the August lows, and then bulls responded to that. At this stage, we just don't have that yet. Taking out that swing high from yesterday is a good first step, but realistically, I want to see prices budge back above that 95 level to show me that we are, in fact, seeing the flow of that downtrend beginning to shift or beginning to change, just not there yet. Now, there are a couple of other areas to look at here. I uh, wanted to go out to the monthly chart because this is looking especially nasty right now. Let me get rid of this short-term fib. There we go. Okay, what I mean by especially nasty is if we look at the wicks on these three, these, these past three, and I mean, we can even go to the past four monthly candles. Notice how there's been like a hard set area of resistance that's been coming in intra-bar around that 95 level, right? We tagged it in May, a little bit of penetration in June, July, deeper in August, but that's the point with which we started to turn around. Now we looked at this last week, weekly bar. We had an evening star pattern that showed up in here, which is usually pretty interesting for bearish reversals. Now I didn't act directly on that because this has simply put us right back down to this near-term support, this prior area of resistance coming into this week. I'm still harboring those long-term bullish USD views. But now that we have seen some slide below support, that's what keeps the door open for that bearish approach. Resistance at old support with a relatively tight stop so that if we do get continuation, fantastic. As you see here on the daily, it appears as though we're in the early stage of that support playing out. So I'd like to see this thing wiggle up a little bit higher and, and actually finding sellers before getting a lot more uh, motivated to play US dollar weakness deeper into September. So again, setups on both sides of this thing, we really got to pick our spots. Now, on the side of US dollar strength, this one is becoming or coming back as very interesting, but we got a similar backdrop here on the monthly chart because if this thing closes with strength over the next day and a half, it's going to be a different picture. Now, we looked at this formation on Tuesday and what we had at the time was a building hammer, okay? Now, a hammer has a long wick underneath the candle and it has a strong body or a bullish body atop, okay? Now, when we were looking at this on Tuesday, prices were above this 1709 Fibonacci level, and I had a nice body to work with up top here, giving us a hammer formation. Now, hammers could be really interesting for bullish reversals because they can indicate capitulation at lows, okay? Hammers will often show at the bottom of a downtrend, and they show intra-bar where prices had run down to fresh lows, tagged an area of support, was met by buyers, that not only erased the entirety of that prior bearish move, but pushed up to fresh highs. That's why the continuation or the, the completion of that hammer formation is gonna be so important to me to look for bullish setups in Euro as we go into September. If I get that monthly bar, that at least opens the door to the fact that we would have already bottomed out. Now we don't have that yet. 
because what happened is after prices shot up to that zone of resistance that we looked at on Tuesday, and as I said, this was basically like my last stop of resistance before I was going to throw in the towel on bearer setups, and I was looking at that knock-in level at about 1750. Break above 1750, close monthly bar above 1750, I have that hammer complete, indicating a bullish reversal on the monthly chart. But at this stage, that resistance has held shorter term. You can see we're starting to tip down with lower highs, lower lows to very early stages. There we go. This lower low took out that prior swing. We get this set of lower highs. Notice that nice rub right along the Fibonacci level. That shows us that we're not the only ones looking at this. There's other traders that are reacting to this thing and have since been able to push this down to another fresh low. So we've seen an increase in some of these bearish factors that have been driving the euro lower. Uh, if we take a step back on the daily, there's really two big themes of note here. In the month of May, we had political risk emanating from Italy. The fear being that the recently installed Italian government was going to play a game of chicken with the ECB as far as Italian bonds were concerned. Now, when that took a step back from the ledge, late May, early June, saw the euro begin to range here. And that range lasted for a couple of months, uh, even through the ECB rate decision that saw the bank say that rates were going to stay at current levels at least through the summer of 2019. Now, what ended up giving us that element of capitulation from that impasse was Turkey. When we started to see Turkey, I don't know how to say this exactly. I don't want to be too uh, too brutally honest on it. But when we started to see Turkish financial markets shake considerably, worry started to percolate that banks in Europe that hold considerable exposure to Turkish banks were then going to run into some pretty stiff problems. Non-performing loans from Turkey means that those Spanish banks that are holding a ton of Turkish exposure may have non-performing loans of their own that are going to seep into Germany or France. And so when we came into August, as Turkish financial markets were shaking, we saw that weakness in the euro. It largely continued. There's the trend line. That's the one I was looking for. Saw that weakness in the euro. We broke below the symmetrical wedge that had built. Resistance at prior support. And then all the way down to 113. Now, 113 marks the low, August 15th. Since then, it was a strong run higher. I tried to I tried two short attempts on the way up, both of which failed, which is why this was my last stop of resistance. And so far, it's holding. So the way that this thing closes is going to be very, very important to the way that I'm going to be able to move forward and the way that I'm going to be able to trade this. If I look at this off the weekly chart, it's still pretty attractive for short side sets. We basically had prices bounce after a fresh low, came up, and have now found resistance within this key zone that have previously held the highs in July. That keeps the door open for stops above that area of resistance. Look for price to move back down towards the 50 fib at around 1448, 1450. If we close this week, hence this month, above 1750, we have that hammer formation on the daily chart. I want to look at this long and strong, and that's pretty much the only way I'm going to move forward until I get a support break. Now, with that being said, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you the shorter term setup here, because one does exist on the long side of the uh, on the long side of the euro. Now, that would basically be looking to this prior area of resistance to come in as new support. I'm not going to act on this, but again, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you because the setup is in fact there. We have area of resistance around 16 and a quarter that runs down to, I believe is about 1590. If we find buyers coming in around that zone, then the door could remain open for long positions, stop below this low, looking for a retest of resistance. Okay. Largely under the presumption that the strength that showed up here would be able to continue to drive. So again, set up some both sides of this thing, but at this point, I got to remain bearish until we get that 1750 break filling in that hammer formation on the monthly chart. Okay. Now, earlier I mentioned there's a new ish area where I'm starting to get more open to USD weakness. That is in the cable. It's been a pretty nasty, pretty nasty year for the cables so far. Probably best expressed through this monthly chart here. Okay, so we have the Brexit move 
uh, helping to uh, establish a Fibonacci retracement, I'm basically taking the June 2016 high down to the uh, agreed upon flash crash low of 1950 that happened in October 2016. Now, if we look at this on the weekly, really, really clean. This helped to catch the top in April, well, technically in January and April, right here at the 786 retracement. And this has also helped to mark the bottom that happened just two weeks ago at this 2671 level, the 23.6 retracement of that same FIB. Now, if we cut down to the daily, we'll notice where up till yesterday, this period remained fairly constrained, right? It continued to show bearish setups just as we looked at on Tuesday because we had this run that came up and started to find sellers showing that we had potential high, uh, lower high resistance something that opened the door for a retest of 2671, but we had what could be considered or could possibly be called a game-changing item show up. I don't use that term very often. I'm not a big fan of the it's different this time mantra. I'm a cynical trader, so most of the time I'm going to expect what's happened to keep happening. But in this scenario, what's happened is uh, it's largely political in nature. Leading into yesterday, the EU had drawn a pretty hard line on Brexit negotiations. It did not look as though the EU was going to cut the UK any slack. It really appeared as though they wanted this to be a punitive measure to punish the UK for choosing to leave the zone. And so leading into yesterday, we were very much harboring the high probability of a no Brexit or a hard Brexit type of scenario. Now that collectively with a dovish BOE is what had helped to push the pound down to such anemic levels after being so strong just five months earlier, four months earlier. We had that combination of a dovish Bank of England, falling rates of inflation, very little motivation for the BOE to jump into a hawkish stance, combined with a lot of risk on the Brexit front. Now, coincidentally, the bigger breaks that Cable had shown actually good drawback to that fib, the bigger breaks that Cable had shown really appeared to come from the Brexit argument, right? As a matter of fact, if we look at the April run, we had come all the way down to this 135 handle after being at 143.52 just a month earlier. It's a couple weeks earlier, really. And even through a dovish BOE rate decision, prices just sat on that support. We didn't actually begin breaking through until we started to get more drama around Brexit. Uh, this particular break came from Nicola Sturgeon announcing the possibility of another Scottish referendum. Downside break of 135, lower high, resistance of prior support, and then it just continued lower. Now we also had some high profile resignations from Theresa May's cabinet. Again, just as that hard Brexit scenario was looking more and more likely. So when we came into the month of August, even though the BOE hiked rates here, that could not stop the declines. Just continued to sell off all the way until that Fibonacci support came into play. Now, yesterday's news gave us a significant break because that downtrend was finally taken out. Now, I have this trend line drawn from the July highs, and notice where the, the prior swing high from Tuesday, the last one that we had looked at, had held right within that zone, right below that prior swing high. But this is when we got the topside breakout on those comments from Michael Barnier. Prices jumped up, found resistance at this prior swing of 130.43. I published an article shortly after that was happening. Give me a second and I'll find that for you. I was looking for prices to top out of that exact price, at which point I could then look to play pullbacks. Now prices have pulled back. They found a little bit of support off of 130, but this is not the level that I wanted to or want to buy it off of. Uh, give me a quick second. I'll get that article for you and then we'll dig down on a short chart. Here we go. I'm gonna put this in the chat box for anybody so interested. Okay, so the same level that I had used as a target two weeks ago, as a point of resistance in this week's FX setups, I'm now going to repurpose as support potential. Now, the reason that I don't want to buy this 130 level is because this door of support keeps getting knocked on to the, de to the degree where bulls appear to be slipping. I could go down even shorter. There we go. See this 30 minute chart? You see, we're getting like the early stage of lower lows and lower highs, a bit of congestion around resistance. Sellers are even getting amped up to 
jump in here to around 130.15. I think this thing's going to continue pulling back, and I want to see if it pulls back until I can find some support in this prior area of resistance. It's a fairly wide zone. It's about 38 pips wide. I could see a wick here off 29.32, a little bit higher off this 29.37, but as long as I find buyers somewhere within this zone, it becomes a workable theme, largely because it allows me to get a stop below prior points of support. There's this swing here at 28.44. We got another one just a little bit below 28 flat, but it allows me to stop below that prior area of support so that if we do see bullish continuation, fantastic. If we don't, I want to get out relatively quick because that prior theme was pretty aggressive. And if I see bears come back with gusto, I don't want to be hanging on to long positions to just hope that they don't take me out by running my stop. So the door appears to be opening for long positions for me. Um, you know, again, we're in a not great time to be triggering longer term sets. It's, if anything, a great time to be evaluating and looking for these things to confirm uh, because we have a holiday this weekend, end of the month, as of tomorrow. And there's a lot of these themes that are percolating out there. This whole softer U, uh, EU on um, Brexit negotiations is a relatively new thing. I want to make sure that it continues to work. All right, dollar yen. All right, so I've been following this one throughout August, looking for prices to pierce through that 111.50 level to open the door for long positions. That happened yesterday. Let's get out a little bit longer. There we go. You can see where we've had somewhat of a, uh, I'm calling or considering just really messy price action over the past month, which is why that 111.50 level is so important to me. So we finally got that fresh higher high. At this point, my job then becomes to try to catch that higher low. It looks like this might still be a little bit early because notice where we had a pretty hard sell off off of those highs, uh, pulled back about 70 pips. But we have seen buyers step in above prior support. That's the big key for me. I need to find higher low support here so that I could get a stop below this level and feel okay about it. At this point, it looks like this thing might still have some ability to cut deeper because we're basically just bouncing off of like 111.10. Now, if we break back above 111.40, at the very least, I could say we have some near-term higher highs. After buyers came in to offer support above that prior higher low, and then I could look for short-term bullish continuation in terms of the longer-term potential for strength. It's got to let these align first. That's not something you want to fade too aggressively, right? Because we had that breakout bar right in there. Notice today's daily bar almost takes out the entirety of yesterday's gains. As long as we see that support hold, that higher low support door remains open. But if we take that out, got to be very, very careful. Continue watching that prior area of support. All right, Swissy. So we looked at this one for short side continuation on Tuesday. This thing had some pretty good run. Ah, uh, yeah, it's had some great run. There we go. It's had some great run, and now we're testing below this 50 fib at 97.08. This is an interesting series of retracements because we had a pretty good resistance check off the 38.2, and I'm basically just drawing this over the two-year major move, taking the low from May 2015, drawing that up to the high of December 2016, three-year move at this point. Here off the weekly, you can see where that support's beginning to dig in. Now, when we get down to it hourly, it's going to be a bit messier because we actually did penetrate below, pulled back above. But at this point, it looks like we have a bit of a support hold. So that prior Fibonacci retracement, notice how I did a pretty good job of uh, there we go, pretty good job of giving resistance after a support break. Right? Notice where these lows come in and sync very well with those, or excuse me, those highs sync very well with those prior lows. Good area of bearish continuation. Bearish continuation has largely continued. So I could look at a pullback to 97.40 to 97.59. Notice those groups, of, uh, those, those prior swing lows to look for lower high resistance, at which point a stock could go above 97.75. I'd call that 97.80. Or conversely, if this break continues to run, I could try to do with this Fibonacci level what this one was able to do which is let prices go down and establish a new low and then pull back and then find a series of sellers at this level. 
I wouldn't consider this there yet because notice that we just had about 28 pips of deviation below the low before this pullback began. I'd want to see this clear out a bit more to get confident that this area might be able to resist. Otherwise, I'd be looking for a slightly deeper pullback. But that short side continuation theme, it still appears alive and well there. It hasn't bounced at least yet. Okay, yen pairs. All right, drawing back to dollar yen real fast. I think this one gives a bit of a cleaner look. I just have a series of Fibonacci levels that are drawn here. Notice where we bottomed out at a confluent area earlier in the month. Uh, well, actually, this was just a week and a half ago. And then we bumped up, and now we're catching a bit of support off of this 23.6% retracement. This is basically just the 23.6 of the March to August major move. March to July, excuse me. Helping to, helping to keep that partially bullish. Now, I wanted to point out the daily bar on dollar yen to you for a reason, because it appears as though we've had an increase in that risk aversion theme throughout today. And there's basically two themes that are drawing this, and I could push this back onto the euro. We had the threat around Italian politics that triggered risk aversion in May. And then earlier in August, we had the threat around Turkey triggering risk aversion there. Now, the second half of the month saw us pull back from the ledge in USD and euro. But I think one of the extra items of yen strength was essentially emanating from risk aversion. Now, as we've, again, pulled back off the ledge over the last couple of weeks, yen weakness has been able to roll back again. But I think the reason that we're seeing a good portion of yesterday's gains erased is because we have seen those items of both Italian politics and the situation around Turkey and the lira come back into the headlines today. Okay, so all of this is to point out that if I am looking at the everything is okay thesis, I want to look for yen weakness. If I'm looking at the risk aversion, oh no thesis, then I want to look for areas of yen strength. Now, this becomes relevant when we look at cross pairs that aren't using or considering or bringing the US dollar into the mix. Euro yen has been very, very, very emotive of late. We saw that strong topside run. I tried to pull a short off 128.52. That did not work. This thing just continued to run higher. Ran all the way up towards this 23.6, at which point we pulled back. But notice this engulfing candlestick right in here today. That shows a pretty aggressive reversal. Now that engulfing is coming back to a confluent area of support, thereby making the setup all the more interesting. Because you can see where buyers are now defending this little chasm that had previously given us some resistance. 129.47 up to 129.66. So this could be looked at for support plays. At this point, it would basically be a bullish reversal off this four-hour chart after that bearish reversal from fresh highs above 130. The stop would need to be appropriated somewhere below this wick. Yeah, I don't think anybody would want to take on too much risk on a setup like this right now as we're moving towards the end of the month. But you can see where that support started to come into play. Not getting too much action off this doji so far. Yeah, so I'd want to see this break back above that 129.66 because at this stage we still have resistance playing at prior support. Prior resistance, that 129.66 level is still coming in. Yeah, this is still bearish. Okay, so to play this bullish, I am going to need some additional, some additional top side here. I don't want it to run all the way to 130, but I at the very least want to see or I had to see this this wick taken out, and then I would like to see something around here being tested first, at which point I could then look to play pullbacks off of this level that's resisting right now. Now, on the short side of the theme, it's going to be hard to chase that engulfing candlestick. The stop would have to go above 131. That's going to be a little bit too much risk for my blood. The one thesis that I would have to be able to pull short positions is if that resistance holds. And then I could at the very least run with the assumption that we have resistance of prior support. And then that could open the door for stops above the 130 big figure. I want to see that hold first. So we're at a big decision point here, Euro Yen. Pound Yen. All right, so with that bullish breakout yesterday, this thing just got vertical for, <laughs> for a good amount of time. I think this was running for about three or four hours before it finally calmed down. Yeah, there's that big bar. I mean, basically had about three hours of run, a little bit of continuation, started to pull back since. Um, 
but like I was looking at with pound dollar, I do think that this could be, again, I hate using that term, but it could be a game changer, particularly if we're walking into EU, UK negotiations around Brexit with a much softer backdrop. I mean, realistically, what is the EU pushing a hard line against the UK do for anybody? It, it, it seems as though it's just being punitive just for the sake of punishment. And that doesn't seem conducive for global growth. Now, I'm not going to get on the political soapbox here, but what I do want to see is some area of support come back in around this key level 143.78. Daily chart. There we go. 143.78. This is simply the 38.2% retracement of this major move, taking the flash crash low up to the February high. More important than that, it's been a big level in the past. This would help the stage resistance just before the topside break. So real simple, looking for support around prior resistance to open the door for bullish continuation. Uh, for stops, we have that prior zone of support runs between 142.33, 142.57. That seems to be a attractive area that could be used for stop placement and look for bullish continuation. All right, got two more dollar setups to go through, only one of which I really want to do anything on. The other I'm going to use for reference to proxy into a cross. Okay, so Aussie. It's been a pretty good pair this month. Um, we got support mid-August off that 72 figure, led into a nice bounce, lower high came down and then we caught another bounce but we got another lower high i want to start looking at this for potential reversals largely because there's not a whole lot that fits in on the short side of the dollar for me um, but also because if I do get a defense of current support of this current low, then at the very least, it opens the door for 40-ish pip stop to play a swing back up towards 73.25, right around there. We had a prior batch of support show around the same area, had a quick swing low that showed up right in here. And at the very least, I might be able to fit in initial entry with a decent risk reward ratio for a retest of the 73.64 level. Now, I wouldn't want to get bullish on this thing for the long term until we got a topside break of that bearish trend line. Don't have it yet, but we do have the support showing underneath. If I get a hold of that trend line, door remains open for uh, short term counter trend setups. Okay, Kiwi is where I don't really want to do anything. There we go. That resistance that we looked at, that Fibonacci resistance, ended up holding. We had seen where this was starting to find some support on this prior bearish trend line. Well, that broke down. Now prices are heading lower after a resistance hold with that Fib right there. See this off the daily chart. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this one up is because of the cross pair that we had looked at on Tuesday, Aussie Key. And it appears as though prices have wiggled back towards that 110 level. You see where we have these topside wicks on the four hour. So we're getting some seller reaction, a bit of equalization even because there's wicks underneath as well. But this is the, this is what would catch my eye more so than that because we do have lower high resistance, good wick response, sub 110, opens the door for stops above the big figure, looking for continuation down or a reprint down to prior lows. Okay, and I got one last setup to look at. U.S. stocks. So I'm trepidatious about buying at 26. It feels like this support is eventually going to give way. Um, you know, again, something that I say quite a bit, but you keep knocking on that door, it's eventually going to open, even if uh, maybe even especially if nobody's home. Um, but the next level that I'm looking for as support, 25,886, the same one that I looked at on Tuesday. If that doesn't hold a bit deeper, around 25,695. And if that doesn't hold, 25,500. I'm basically just looking to play prior bullish trend structure for continuation up to new highs. That's all that I got. I know that uh, it's not super exciting, but when the market gives you trends, you got to trade trends. You got to roll with it. You got to go in the direction of the bias. So far, that bias has been strong to the upside. Uh, only fear I have here is that support might not hold. And I don't want to sit in here while this thing traces or pulls back. So instead, I want to try to pick my spots, try to catch support off each of these levels. Relatively tight stop. If it doesn't hold, take the loss. Look for support at a deeper level. 
no reason to hang around just to hope that I might have been right. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. Don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. Uh, from Quran, where is DXY available for trading, please? It's a futures contract, so any futures, well, most futures brokers will offer some element of access to the DXY uh, futures contract. It's a currency future. Uh, from Tyandros, if you look, you will see that all the retracements do not exceed 23.9 for the last several months. Tracements 23.9. Sorry, Tom. I'm not sure what you might be referring to here. <laughs> yeah, Pete says, and this is referring to that zone in Euro dollar. It says, uh, I have 15.90 on a post it note from one of my monitors. Yeah, that's where I was looking as the low of the zone, and I don't think. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I, this hadn't printed yet. I can't remember exactly where I'd pulled 1590 from, but yeah, that was the bottom of the zone. I think 1624 was the top of the zone. He says, my man, that's why you stick to your levels no matter how you feel. Yeah, it's something that I learned a long time ago where you can't help it as a human being. Your emotions are going to seep into the equation. You know, you can't help it. You're going to see something when you got money on the line. You're going to be biased when you look at it. It's just human nature. But if I keep this on my chart, at the very least, there's some element of objectivity and facts are simply facts, right? If price comes up and breaks my resistance, that was resistance break or at least resistance test through my level. That's something that triggers a stop. That's just cold, cold, hard facts. Motions do very little good, very little good in this game. Uh, for Kaya Forest, money management question, stop loss placement. I split my positions into one one and one two profit ratios. So I'm assuming like a scale out approach. Uh, once I reach one one, move stop to break even. But a retrace to that BE is always going to be inside of the trend line that triggered the trade with the first place. Do you stick with the BE stop loss and just look for a way to re-enter if the trade retraces all the way back to the original trend line? Or do you eat the extra pips? And let the trade run. Aussie in short caught me in this situation. Okay, so first let me answer the first part of that question because that was awesome. It's a great question. I personally go to my break even point. I don't care if it's inside of the trend line because for me it's a lot easier to walk away from the position knowing I have no initial risk at play. You know, after I have that first win of the setup, that first scale, I don't want to leave any additional vulnerability on the table if I can help it. The exception is if it's a longer term setup where I feel really good about the backdrop. Now, a trend line on like a daily or a monthly chart could fit that bill, where I'd be a little bit more respectful of the technical formation than I would my original entry price and getting my stop to break even. But I think that's more of a flavor question just based on personality. I'm a pretty risk averse guy, just for whatever reason, it's just the way I was made. And so for me, it means a lot to get that initial stop beyond my break-even entry price so that if I'm asleep or I'm away, at the very least, I have some level of protection. Now, I can still get gapped through on that stop. I know that full well. But at the very least, I've done what I can do to protect the gains that I have left or at least protect the removal of my initial risk. That's just what what works better for me. Um, now, with that said, I know a lot of folks that get they, – they don't have a – they don't have um, – an easy way of just getting back into a trade after the EA stop, right? As in, if I move my stop to break even, even if it's inside of a trend line, prices come back, hit my stop, tag the trend line, and then bounce, that's something that mentally will beset them. They'll be very upset that they called the trade correctly, but they ended up eating a stop on the second piece or the remaining piece, or even if it's a break even stop. And so, you know, for those folks, the other direction might be better. It's just something that I have a hard time seeing with my own eyes because that's not really how I am. Much more concerned with getting that initial risk off the table. Okay, so uh, continuation of the question. Aussie in short, caught me in this situation last night, for example. Complication is you have to be able to catch the second entry point, London session, media sleep, New York session, work regular day job. That could be tough. Um, and, and the last thing I want to do is suggest a style change, especially if what you're doing is working. But 
I think one of the things that could maybe make this a little more simple is this four hour chart. Because at the very least you have uh, fewer decision points in a typical day. Uh, I'm here in New York as well. Um, there's going to be six four hour candles. Reasonably, you're going to miss at least one because you're going to be asleep, maybe two. But if you could just take 10 minutes at the closure of each of these four hour candles, so we're talking 1, 5, and 9 p.m. and a.m., but if you take 10 minutes just to look at the closed four hour candle, then it kind of leverages your time so that you can still manage the trade without following it too closely. I think that would be maybe one of the uh, more operative suggestions that I can make. That four hour chart could be pretty a pretty great option for those that do have, I don't want to say a life, but a life outside of trading. Five, nine, and one, five, nine, and one. Um, from Kaya, uh, how do you play news? If you're in a position, how do you manage your risk when news approaches? NAFTA and dollar cat, for example. NAFTA is a non, kind of a non-issue to me. Um, as in, I'm not playing any setups just directly for you know, an increase in NAFTA tensions or anything like that. Um, I try not to consider it playing news. I try to incorporate news. So this week, for instance, we had a couple of euro items this morning. We have another euro item tomorrow. I'll look at that as an absolute value of a driver. All I know is it has the potential to bring volatility into the equation. If I have a downtrend with prices setting at resistance, then the way I look at it is I can get an angle or, or, or a bit of leverage and getting a relatively tight stop with a decent profit target if that trend extends on the data release. Now, with that said, some of these data releases are pretty wild and chaotic, like NFP. NFP is not something that I want to scalp around at all. When I go into that, I'm going to try to manage off my risk as well as I can. Stops to break even on positions with gains and positions with losses, I'm going to follow those very, very closely, maybe even cut them off beforehand if I really don't like the trade or if I really don't like the setup. That's a extreme rarity. I will rarely kill something before it has a chance to stop out itself, but I, I, I won't usually go into NFP completely exposed. I'm okay with playing reactions off of an NFP print. As in, if I got a good level, let's say we're sitting in front of NFP, I'm following this zone of resistance right in here on Euro. If prices uh, tick back, find sellers 15, 20 minutes after NFP, then the door could open for a short side set, stop above the high to look for that retracement to play out. But if it doesn't, and I do see prices continue to bubble, then I got to stick to that stop, let that thing take me out. I don't want a short-term trade to become a long-term problem. William O'Keefe, good to see you, buddy. LDHF. Uh, from Pete, the wick is where I got my 2930 level, 2019, only if it's an aggressive wick for my blood. And I believe Pete is referring to cable. Basically looking for this thing to droop down, find some higher low support off that prior resistance. Feels like that's a trap right there around 130. <laughs> um Karan, UJ, isn't daily time time frame trend down? Well, I mean, it's been an uptrend since like March, April. I think it bottomed out. Yeah, this is what I'm looking at. Bottomed out here in March. We were like 104. You could call that a downtrend, but that would be like... And that would be like a four hour chart, maybe even a little lower, right? Because that's where we started to get lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower low. All right, but then that's why that 111.50 was so big. We broke above, made a higher high. At this point, I got to try to catch support and a little bit of ride off that trend line projection. But again, I just want to see that higher low support come in right over there. You know, while that's also uh, why it's, it's more usable to me than a short side setup would be is if I get my stop right down there, I'm risking 30 or 40 pips. And if I get it back to 111.80, 60 pips upside, that's a one to 1.5 just on a punch back up to the high. I, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about predicting the direction than I am how much I have to put in versus how much I might be able to make. 
I truly do look as the, at the future as brutally uncertain. And I think the best that I could do is try to read these prevailing themes and jump on the direction they've been showing. That's why I'm so adherent to near-term trend. We had this fresh higher high, it pulled back. Maybe that theme is dead and gone, I don't know. But the fact that we were able to punch up to that high, that says something. So if I do see buyer support come back in before we could retest those prior lows, that shows me that there's still that bullish motivation that's out there. But perhaps more important than that, I could get in for a relatively tight stop. And if I'm wrong, I lose 40 pips. If I'm right and I'm able to get that first scale out, it's a 1 to 1 1.5. Stop the break even, then I see if I can get some more going into the end of the month. Hey, it's my pleasure, Pete. It's definitely my pleasure to pleasure to help. Yeah, and I'm, I'm honestly surprised we didn't get more comments on the Brexit front in here. Um, Karan says, pure churlishness in defense of the supranational project. It was very, so I have kind of a grievance with the term war. I grew up in a military family. My dad went to war. I, a couple times I thought he was gone. And war is a brutal, ugly, disgusting thing, in my opinion. And I don't like using that term for trade. But when you see one economy or nation willing and even wanting to punish another nation simply for being or voicing a democratic vote, that's problematic to me. At least with bombs, there's a reason. And I'm not going to justify bombs in any case, but, you know, it, 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 you know, so a lot of people are talking about trade wars right now with how the U.S. is acting towards a bunch of different trade partners. To me, willingly wanting to punish a trading partner because they don't want to play by your supernationals, that, that, you know, that, that's, that's a whole other story. But again, I don't want to get on my political soapbox here. Um, Mr. Tyandros, Italian tins and twos blew out today, and Erdogan does not understand he is wrestling with mother and human nature. We can't jail or kill. Looking at Argentina yields blow out, lots of smoke and fire burning, hard breaks as a exploding cigar for the EU, Yunker, and May. And so I think Ty hits hits the apex point of this game theory, right? Which is the EU walked this hard line to the end, and they're not in a great position to be playing hardball, pushing the UK into recession with a hard breaks type of scenario, because inev inevitably it's going to impact them negatively as well. And then who's to blame for that? I mean, the fingers end up going right back to Yunker. All right, a question from Demetrios. Hi, James. I'd like to ask you specifically regarding pullbacks and reentry points to trend continuation. Let's take an example, dollar yen. There was a pullback from 111.83 and currently around 111.30. Do we look for support at both previous resistances or support as well, or only for previous resistances only? That's up to you. It depends on how aggressively you want to hit this. I, I mean, I know, I know you wanted something more telling, but frankly, I never know where these moves are going to bounce from either. The best that I could do is just read price action and try to go with the flow. What I'll generally do is I'll look at all of those points of resistance as potential areas for pullback support. And I'll wait to see which one comes up. Lo and behold, the one that's holding right now, it's random, but it's from August 16th. It's this little swing high that came up at like 111.12. It's a pronounced swing high, right? Notice that long wick that was just sticking out there. There's something there. I don't know what. Something happened, but... And that's where support's coming from right now. Um, but yeah, just because we have some element of short-term support, I don't want to just go chasing it. And I could let prices move back up to prove that bulls might be able to continue shifting this tide that's shown up over the last day. If I'm going to look at a reversal type of setup, it's got to pay me, as in I, I need to get really strong risk-reward odds to justify that because I'm going to have a higher rate of failure just by the very nature of playing reversals, right? As in, if I am going to buy off of 111.12 under the presumption that this prior area of resistance is going to hold the support, then I'm going to want to look for like a 1 to 3 risk reward ratio because I'm not under the expectation that that's going to win more than 25% of the time. That's why I'm usually willing to wait and pay for a little bit more confirmation because at the very least, I can let that flow change on a shorter term chart to prove that we might be getting that movement intra bar. But as far as which areas of prior resistance can come in as support, Depends on the market, buddy. Really does. Um, that 111.12 level appears to be what's helping this thing to dig out right now. But like I was saying earlier, I'm not too convinced that that's going to hold. 
Sure enough, right after we bounced, saw a little bit more seller reaction. So all I need is some evidence that we have higher low support. I could go with the early stage of that thesis right now and say, okay, well, yeah, we got a bounce here starting to show in this four hour chart. I could get a stop there of 30 pips. Profit target of 40, 50. So if I'm going to get a 40 pip target with a 30 pip stop, a one to 1 1.3 risk, risk to reward ratio, a little bit more usable, but I'm going to need that to win about 44% of the time to get break even on the strategy as a whole long term, right? I don't think that I would be carrying that good of odds on it. So that's what, again, why I'm usually willing to wait for confirmation on these lower time frame charts. Uh, from Quran, please would you show how a FIB extension has or might work on any pair or index after breaking all time highs? <sighs> yeah, sure. I got one for you. Give me a second to load this up. If memory serves, it was the German unification move in the DAX. Trying to remember which one that was at. I think it was the 618 extension. Yeah, so it was the 618 extension that we were running into last year that was given some resistance here in uh, in the DAX, right? It gave us a pullback. Prices broke above, they traded like just any other regular area of resistance, or at least the way that I look at these. Uh, some folks will trade extensions as like a, a top out of a move or an area to try to predict a top. I'm not really that interested in that. But if we look at the 618 extension here on the daily chart, notice how it's even holding today. And this is from the German unification move, 1990 up to the 2000 top. And that's still holding at that level, uh, prior support. Now, as to what to do with it, at this stage, best I would have, looking at resistance, stop above the high, looking for resistance to play out, retest of the lows. But I don't get, you know, really uh, significantly more excited than any other area or level of resistance. You know, whether this has been a FIB, a FIB extension or expansion. Now, with that said, I don't do anything very articulate with FIB extensions. I mean, you won't see a lot of these on my chart. I think the 272 had done something as well. And yeah, I'm drawing these negative because extensions have to be drawn on upside down fibs. Um, meaning, if I wanted to get this to fib correctly, whereas the 1.272, I basically would have to draw my Fibonacci retracement backwards. It's 1990, there we go. Right now, I can set this up at the 1.68, 1.272. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I needed to hug this one a little bit closer to that 1990 low, but that's where to tag the high. But again, you know, kind of the same thing. It gave us a good pullback, a level of resistance. We eventually broke above, and then it continued to show intra bar price action on this monthly. Uh, Scott Henderson with a very apropos question. I'm a Germany 30 futures trader. So we use uh, trading the DAX and look for a break of 1210 over a few months. What do you think? 12,100? That's very possible. I mean, especially considering some of these European items of risk, you know, because if you're looking for well, 12,100, I mean, we're basically just going to need to test below this little quick area of support that's come in over the last three months. Twelve one, twelve one's doable.
Yeah, I think 12 ones doable. I wouldn't want to be long here. Uh, Usain, sorry about this if I didn't do it uh, well as we were going through the pairs, buddy. Um, can you show weekly chart for Aussie dollar, dollar yen, euro yen, pound yen? Yeah, sure. I'll answer the next few questions while doing so. Um, we'll start off with Aussie dollar. Put up the weekly. I'll leave it there for a second, and you can uh, screenshot it as much as you'd like. There you go. Uh, from Pete, I kind of figured the yen move was risk-related. I was really searching yesterday in the news, et cetera, for something I might have missed, i.e. BOJ member or something out there to the empire's currency so abruptly. Um, biggest move of the summer, I think. I think it's just – so we, we have seen both of those risk items come back into the headlines today. Um, Lira was dropping. Lira started dropping again yesterday, which is why I think the euro topped out. And – the Italian bond sell off earlier today. I mean, that started to catch headlines again. Um, and then there was the Italian comment, I think it was yesterday, that said that the Italian government was going to request that the ECB do uh, QE for Italian bonds. Now, I think the fear factor there is it exposes a, a frailty within the ECB and the, the, and the European model. Technically, I don't believe that, that would be legal at this point because the ECB isn't supposed to bail out an individual state unless they subscribe to the OMT program, the Outright Monetary Transactions Program, which would, in essence, put uh, Italy under ECB controls. And I don't think they want to do that, especially the newly installed government who ran on somewhat of a hard line. So there's, you know, kind of a game of chicken going on within European economics right now, or could be especially if this thing heats up. But, you know, as both of those risk items came back into the headlines, seeing some yen strength flow back in, it, it, to me, it made a lot of sense as like, you know, a, a risk off type of move. Now, with that said, we didn't really see stocks impacted that much, which is why I think that's not necessarily a popular view right now. But I'm of the ilk that stocks are kind of doing their own thing and don't really, um, they're doing their own thing and don't really get, um, you know, overly excited by a lot of these bearish drivers because just so much focus is on keeping this thing up right now. I mean, what would Trump say if this thing went down 10%? How many heads would roll? You know, I think that's one of the reasons this market just keeps jumping. It's hard to imagine a bear market scenario, a 20% off scenario, uh, for me at least at this stage in the Trump presidency. Uh, from Tim Han, hi James, notice some of your stops are below second level of support or resistance and not exactly first level where price might hold. Why is that? It depends on how confident I am in the setup and how badly I want to get in there. If it's something like this Euro Yen pullback, I don't want to trifle with this too much because it's had extreme volatility on both sides of the trade. On the way up and then on the way down, it's been coming very, it's come back very, very harsh. If I'm going to look to get long on this thing, I don't want to take too much, uh, I'm trying to think of a, proper way of saying this. I don't want to take uh, too much pullback off of this, so to speak, right? Like, I don't want to let this one cut in me 30 or 40 pips beyond where I need to just to prove that I'm wrong. If this support doesn't hold, I know that I'm wrong and I need to get the heck out of there. I don't want to hang around for an extra 40 pips just to hope I might've been right yesterday, you know? Um, now, conversely, if we did not have this support break, if this thing had honored this bullish structure, run up to fresh highs, pulled back and found resistance of prior support, that's where I'd be a little bit more forgiving. That's where I'd be open to putting a stop below that prior swing low and saying, all right, I'm going to give you some room to wiggle your yen. I don't care if you pull back 30 pips. I'll accept it because I'm below this prior area support that held up pretty well. You look pretty good so far. You're in good standing with me. So, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of room to run, a little bit of room to mess up before I'm going to call it off. But because we had that support break, because we had a really nasty spill back, I'm going to give this less room for uh, malfeasance. I'm going to take less BS here, I think is a better way of putting it. And I think it's just like life, right? You got those friends that are always on time or that always do things right. The person that's going to be there when you need them. And so you cut them more, more slack, right? Because they're honorable people and you know that they're going to hold up. I'll feel like that. 
about a trend that is continuing to hold higher low support at good levels, hasn't violated the uptrend yet. But then you got those friends that are kind of flaky. They rarely show up. They're often late, disheveled. And you can't really trust that person a whole lot. So if you have a job and they that they happen to do, I mean, even if you let them have it, you're still going to be watching them. It's kind of like that when I get the support break. I'm going to be a little bit tighter with my risk. <laughs> KJ Wachowski, a life outside of trading. What's that? Trade one minute charts. Sometimes I forget to eat. <laughs> That's awesome. So they have this new thing out called Soylent. Kidding, kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. They actually do have this thing out. It's, a, it's called a meal replacement, I mean, largely for computer programmers that don't want to move. They just want to make, you know, a quick meal for sustenance and they mix up one of these shakes. I'm not going to recommend that at all. Apparently it tastes nasty and I haven't tried it. So uh, from Pete, like you said, previously fortunate that occurred below 1750. If the pair recovers by close tomorrow, I'll be impressed with the hammer and go forward from there. Yes, sir. That's about the best we can do, you know, is draw a line in the sand, you know, and, and treat these pairs like they have to perform if they want our, if they want our flow. You know, and if it doesn't perform, I have no reason to stick around. There's no reason for me to be in a 100 pip stop when 30 pip stop will do the job. And if it doesn't perform, then we got to cut it. Uh, from Chris Siapa, uh, today's daily bar on the euro seems to confirm a reversal. It's right at resistance off a of FIB from 1851 to 13. The daily MACD appears to be rolling over stock and RSI as well. Uh, all the rate fundamentals and economic data appear to point to dollar strength. Do you think the longer term bear euro and bull dollar is still in play? Or do you think we have a dollar a daily reversal for 120 euro and 92 dollar? I wish I knew. I just try to trade that next bar and then go from there. The way that I'm looking at this really is twofold. I mean, there is a bear and bull case here in USD. So that longer term chart is what I'm referring to. Weekly, or excuse me, monthly, uh, 2011 to 2017 major move. The fact that we held the support at 50 it points to the possibility of this uptrend that has been running for six years. It could have the power to continue. Now, the fact that we've whipped off here the last four months seems to indicate to me that this thing needs to pull back. But if we catch higher low support here at 91.93, that door remains open for bullish continuation of this longer term trend. It does. Um, that's just the DXY chart. Now, this weekly, and that's what points to the fact that we might be dipping a bit lower. And that's what exposes this level to me for a longer term area of potential support. That evening star came in right off of that 23.6% retracement. So some pretty hard resistance to brought in some new sellers, push prices down to fresh lows. Broke below that support now. So again, short term pullback to prior support, looking for continuation. But there's a case to be made for this thing coming back down to settle at another higher low at this 38.2 before looking for bullish continuation going into 2019. I mean, the rate situation would seem to point to that, right? ECB is nowhere near hiking rates. And it seems like even if they had to, they would pull a BOE type of scenario where they had let inflation run above target for a year or so before they would have to or be you know, backed into a rate hike. But there is a bullish longer term case considering, you know, a, a few months worth of USD weakness to come down and find higher low support. Um, Euro. Okay. So politically speaking, or I guess maybe economically speaking, I'm not a big fan on long-term Euro viability scenarios. Here's what I think keeps that together. The U S doesn't want to be a sole reserve. Being a sole reserve has traditionally been a, a major hindrance to a single superpower based global backdrop, right? It exposes you to ill-gotten gains, especially in times of risk aversion. Times of risk aversion. So like, let's just say that Europe continue to hit the skids with what's going on in Turkey. Um, and well, I mean, any of the other social issues, take your pick. But if that happened, and we did say, see the Euro melt down to parity, Meltdown, not even a meltdown, but if we didn't see a tick down to parity, well, that's going to be some significant dollar strength. That dollar strength is going to hit U.S. exports strong. It's going to hit it very hard. And then it's going to choke growth in the U.S. economy. We are at this point truly a globalized beast to the point where your neighbor's performance very much matters. So I don't think that any of these themes would go on for a very long time unless something within the construction of the EU changed. 
you know, something politically. The current backdrop, it appears as though everybody's vested interest is in the same pool. The U.S. wants to see the euro hold up so that the U.S. dollar is the only global reserve currency that's out there. If you look at the U.S. dollar on a longer term chart, I think you get a good idea of what I'm referring to. Because after the euro came into inception, there we go. After the euro came into inception, I mean, it was, it, it was you know, the proverbial gust behind the sale for the U.S. dollar, right? We ran up initially. That was around the, 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 the tech bust. But as this was happening, that's when we started to see growth in the U.S. really starting to take hold. And this was largely, I mean, if you think about it, we topped out here in 02, we bottomed out in 08. This was during a rising rate cycle. This was largely on the back of global reserve currency flows going into or being denominated into the euro and away from the U.S. dollar. If you take, say, like, you know, a, a, a global central bank, say, within Africa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Well, you go back to 1995, they're going to have a lot of the reserves in U.S. dollars. You go 2005, well, now they're starting to put reserves into the euro to diversify that currency basket, right? And that's something that very much helped USD, weakness in the currency, uh, boost to exports, win behind the sales. That export growth leads to U.S. growth. It's a symbiotic equation that which everybody's happy. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes we get dollar strength, and then that will lead to a slowdown in growth. And that's kind of what we had in 2016, 2017 after this quick jerk of dollar strength. We had the dollar sell off last year. Sure enough, growth numbers have come right back. We just printed at 4.2. Who would have thought that? 4.2% growth for last quarter. But um, so, yeah, to get back to your question, there is a case to be made for what I would consider long term weakness down towards this FIB, which would still retain this longer term bullish structure within the US dollar. Uh, as far as a euro breakup scenario, I wouldn't be at the point of, of getting too excited about those yet. But this is something where the ECB and the Eurozone has a number of uh, issues in front of them. And there's a big resistance zone right in there. Okay, I got to take the last question of the day and then we'll finish it off for this week. Ty says, you know, the EU banks are bust. There's a lot of them that aren't in, good, aren't in a good spot. Aren't in a good spot. Hey, definitely, Scott. My pleasure to help. <laughs> Pete says, uh, Gargling and Malfeasance, name of my new band. I'll buy a CD, man. I don't know if I have a CD player, but I'll buy one for you. Uh, okay, last question of the day. And this is a good one here from Demetrios. And uh, for any questions that did come in that I wasn't able to answer, feel free to ask me on Twitter, and I'll do my best to get back with you in a timely manner. Um, Demetrios asked, thanks, buddy. And another one, if you have the time, can you explain the mechanics of risk aversion between USD and JPY? Is it basically that when there is volatility in USD, especially against the euro, JPY acts as risk aversion cushion and raises the USD, uh, and raises against the USD? Uh, would you be able to provide an example too, if possible? Thanks again. Okay. So traditionally speaking, both the US dollar and the Japanese yen we'll see items of strength in risk off or risk aversion environments or marketplaces. Between the two of recent, it's appeared as though the yen has had that preference for additional strength. Now, I think there's a couple ways of looking at this. One is the, the standard definition, which is in a flight to quality, people want risk averse assets, so they're willing to bid prices higher under the presumption of safe harbors. Right. I think that's an element of it. But I think there's also the unwind that we have to consider. As in, if we look at this dollar yen move over the last six years, we had this really strong jump on the back of yen weakness that was driven by BOJ policy. Now, my explanation behind this is that as we see risk aversion flare, there's still some of that drive to buy the yen for safer harbors. But there's also the unwind of that previous theme. As investors say, you know what, the 2% I'm making in this dollar yen carry is just not worth it. I'm going to can it and wait to see if I could buy this back at a lower price. So I do think that there's an unwind uh, feature that goes along with that as well. Now, if we look at this on a longer term basis, that dollar yen setup, we're still kind of elevated longer term. Now, I can see what Karan is referring to as far as the downtrend that she had mentioned a moment ago or a little bit earlier in, uh, in the webinar. 
But this was the uptrend that I was referring to that basically went from support to resistance and we've been holding for a little while. But we will see periods with which the yen will strengthen against the dollar in those times of risk aversion. And again, I, th I think there's an unwind element that goes along with the rush into the yen because it's considered to be a safe currency. Now, some will often say, okay, well, it's safer than the US dollar. I don't know that I'd go that far. I think one of the reasons the yen remains safe is because of the military proxy backdrop, um, which is the second longest treaty in the world right now is between the US and Japan. After World War II, the US offered what's called the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation with Japan. It basically says you can't raise an offensive military, but we will protect you if you need that. So it's basically kind of like a military partnership, more or less. So one of the reasons the U.S. is the reserve currency is because of military. Push comes to shove, the whole thing melts down. Most likely the thing that will still be standing is the U.S. dollar because at the very least they have the U.S. military to defend it. Well, Japan has that as well through the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation. And so I think that's one of the reasons that Japan is often considered to be a safe area to invest in because it has that American overhang from that treaty. But it also has a strong economy where uh, with, with, with a lot of capital saved up from the citizens in the economy itself. That is why we will often see yen strength in times of risk aversion, even against the US dollar. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. Um, again, to any questions that I wasn't able to get to, I'm very, very sorry. But if you do want to ask anything additional, please don't hesitate to ask me on Twitter. Give me one second. I'll get you my Twitter feed. I'm right here. I'm going to type that in the chat box at J Stanley FX. And I'll do my best to get back with you in a timely fashion. I'm trying to be a little bit better about uh, checking Twitter throughout the day. So we'll see if, uh, see if we can make that happen. But thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.